Stephen, I'll get you to give me a quick thumbs up if you can hear me, just to make sure the audio is good. Okay, great. Okay, good morning, everyone, and and good afternoon. I think we might have one or two folks on uh, from Europe. Um, so really excited to host uh, our next Discovery Garden webinar uh, today, which is on our institutional repository solution. Uh, I will introduce uh, our panelists in a moment, Stephen uh, Perkins and Dan Aiken. Um, but before we do that, I just wanted to, to kind of give an overview of, of the next 60 minutes or so. Um, you know, when we when we do these webinars, we really hope that um, we, we actually get kind of good dialogue going. And so the intent is to spend 20, 25, maybe 30 minutes on, on content, um, but, but then actually uh, open up the floor uh, for, for a good dialogue. Um, so we historically have used the, the chat and Q&A function in Zoom. So if you have any questions as we step through, uh, feel free to, to, to bubble them up um, so you, you don't forget what they are. Um, and, and otherwise, we hope that we, we have a good dialogue towards the end. Um, Stephen, I'll get you to flip to the next page, please. I think most of you probably know a little bit about Discovery Garden. Um, I'll, I'll just spend a quick minute on this. Um, so the company has been around for about a decade now and was founded out of the Islandora project at UPEI, which is the University of Prince Edward Island, a uh, small province, uh, but beautiful place based uh, in Canada. Um, over the last 10 years, the, the company has really developed um, a solid range of, of services and exclusive Islandora based products for both collections, digital collections, uh, and institutional repositories, uh, as well as an AWS backed Islandora 8 preservation storage architecture. Um, we held a webinar uh, last month on the Islandora 8 solution. And so if you're interested in that, would encourage you to, to check out our YouTube channel where we've posted the video, uh, but then also feel free to reach out at any point in time and we can, we can kind of step you through a demo or provide you with any information uh, that you need. Um, so, you know, we have, we have a great uh, team that has a ton of uh, experience uh, and, and two of which are featured with us here today. Uh, Stephen Perkins is our solution architect and project manager. Um, he has solid experience in both Islandora and Drupal uh, and has a wealth of experience directing uh, projects for cultural heritage and academic institutions throughout his, his very tenured and, and great career. Uh, we also have Daniel Aiken, uh, who will step through um, some material throughout the session today, uh, who's our senior developer and product evangelist. Uh, and he has, uh, you know, also a wealth of, of experience with both Islandora and Drupal. So uh, you're in good hands. Uh, and with that, I will pass the floor over to Stephen. Oh, you're on mute, Stephen. Good day, everyone. Thanks for taking the time to uh, to meet with this. I'm gonna stop my video, and then you won't get to see my chin on the uh, on the big screen. So, Dan and I have been working uh, a lot together on the IR product for Island Dora, and before we we got to work, which was rather quickly before the the Spurt conference in Mississippi, the Southern Mississippi IR conference in April. We just set out to look at the basic impacts that an IR should provide. And it really comes down to five things. So firstly, you've got to have secure storage preservation and management of, of research outputs. You're going to need to meet your records management um, requirements. You're going to need to be able to have redundancy and security with regards not just to the storage, but to access. You're going to need to have controlled source identified publication of scholarly outputs through interfaces that support learning, research, and collaboration. You've got kind of a wide audience to deal with. You've got scholars, you've got administrators internally, reviewers, people from outside institutions that you want to collaborate. And you also want to have interfaces to interact with your repository outside of the web interface. You're going to need to have support for administrative processes. Um, so you're going to need to be able to integrate single sign-on for your users, be able to provision roles, control accesses to features of the IR, control access to content, 
you're going to be able to take care of reports, you want to be able to organize content logically. We'll talk, we're going to tunnel down a little bit in the next slide into some of the details. You'll need to be able to have profiles of your organizational units, i.e. your faculty, schools, research centers, campuses, and the scholars that work within them. So scholars can we should be able to have profiles where they store their identifiers, such as their ORCID identifiers, are able to link to the works that they've created, both within and, and perhaps without of the repository, and have their data linked in such a way that they can be used in, in different presentational uh, configurations. Now, you're also going to need to integrate with external services. Some organizations already have current research information systems, which may be used for handling uh, things such as funding or grant reporting um, or, and uh, just general management of scholar and research information campus wide. So you're going to need to be able to integrate with that. You need to be able to integrate with other services such as those to create unique identifiers such as handles or DOIs or ARC identifiers. You want to be able to publish to aggregators, um, whether it's using something as pretty common as OAI, but maybe you need to export data to data site or other outlets that will aggregate and report and expose your outputs. So these are the kind of the main, the five main areas that we need to tunnel into the requirements of. Now, today we're going to cover three of these five areas, two of them will be subject of subsequent um, webinars because they're, they're worthy of having an entire breakout of their own. So one of those that we'll cover later will be storage preservation. But basically these requirements that we're listing here, you're going to need to be scalable, secure, it needs to be performant for the number of users that you're, uh, you're, you're supporting, you need to have intelligent and redundant storage, you need to have recovery plans, antivirus in place since people are submitting content from outside and also to be able to monitor file formats because you're also concerned with obsolescence. Other things not listed here might be uh, being able to locate duplicate resources, etc. So all of those are covered by the Discovery Garden AWS preservation platform for Islandora 8. That'll be, that's, that's as I said, worthy of an entire session of its own, so it'll get it. We'll talk a bit about discovery and presentation. You have to be able to get people the information that they need quickly. So you need search and navigation that's fast and very easy to take in and locate things. Research outputs require specialized displays. It's not like looking at a Campeche chair in your digital collection. And they can be very broad in the, in the variety of, uh, of metadata profiles and uh, materials that they present. So, we're going to talk a bit about that uh, that variety in, in just a little bit. You need to be able to make a branded presentation. This is about your institution. It's about being able to show impact from the efforts that you're putting into research. You're going to need to be able to manage ancillary content or supplementary content uh, outside of uh, the repository uh, within your within your web interface, and you want to be able to promote that as well. You want to be able to have your content exposed in such a way you've got search friendly URLs, for instance, a site map, um, and be able to integrate that with your analytics, which we'll, which we'll discuss. So we'll be talking about that today. Also administration, user management, access control, I talked about being able to perform reports, being able to have mediated content workflows. Perhaps you have ETD workflows that you need to integrate with, which you may or may not handle within the IR. So the IR needs to be flexible with regards to uh, being able to accommodate uh, the various uh, workflow requirements of institutions that implement it. Um, you'll need to have publication and removal processes as well. Now, content management we'll also talk about today. Um, being able to manage the status of publications, uh, being able to quickly display the rights for something, the license, being able to version research data sets, being able to access those scholar and organizational profiles and manage them, have the scholars be able to manage their own profiles. Um, we're gonna look at bit at how we leverage taxonomies massively in the IR for a lot of these things. And of course, you wanna be able to have uh, the ability to uh, communicate in open metadata standards across, the, across platforms. Now, integrations we won't cover today, 
But we did talk about that, and that'll be a later webinar. We're going to go through some of the ways that you can integrate using the available APIs in the Discovery Garden uh, Islandora Institutional Repository to integrate with other things. And these are just some ideas of what you might have. You might integrate with impact measurement services, research aggregators, uh, external taxonomies. Uh, that you want to use via web services. You might want to maybe you uh, use another platform to handle your ETD workflows. You want to be able in to import uh, publishable content into the IR. And there's interfaces to do all of that. So IRs are pretty special. They've got a lot of requirements. Now, the biggest thing, um, you know, one of the things that I'm the proudest of in this product is that we're able to effectively profile all types of outputs. Um, now, some of you may have all of these, some of you may have a small subset or even manage in just thesis, but to explain some of the abbreviations that are on the screen here, um, TROs, these are traditional research outputs. So these are peer reviewed scholarly works, data research data sets, non-data research outputs. So these are not peer reviewed outputs, but they're also not data sets. So these may be various publications, say conference papers and such non-traditional research outputs are unique ways that other things such as exhibits or media that have been produced are considered research outputs and funded by grants. So we need to be able to manage these along with gray literature and sometimes educational assets as well, learning materials. That's a pretty broad variety of stuff to put in play in an IR. And I think we've done so in a way that's, that's very flexible um, and Dan will give you a look at some of the no-code ways that we've set up to configure the IR such that whenever you work with one of these types of research outputs, you're only exposed to the profile of the data that's used for that particular type of output. We also have the ability to create typed relationships between things in the repository. So for instance, maybe you have both a data set and a published or unpublished paper that references it, you can create type relationships. And you can also create links to external resources. Let's say you have a pre-pub version of a journal article that you want to link to a published version on, uh, on the, the journal website. That's fine. Um, and all of this information can be presented to the user. So as I said, we do a lot of this by using taxonomies to manage controlled and, un and uncontrolled vocabularies. And these vocabularies are to a large extent configurable by the implementer. So if you use um, a broad set of licenses, say you're using uh, Creative Commons, MIT, or new licenses, you can put these all into a taxonomy and allow your users to interact only, use only the ones that you allow within your repository. Same things with rights. We, we give an out of the box taxonomy for using the, um, the right statement.org uh, right statements. So, all of these let you build a web of not just the file assets, but the metadata, these associated controlled vocabularies, and all of the uh, scholars and organizational units. All be give, they give this a very, very rich relationship. Now, we also have options for deposit mediation. Um, as I alluded to earlier, people have varying requirements for of different levels of complexity for their inbound submissions. Some people allow self-submission, self which we support, and some people don't, which you can configure the, the DGIR to, uh, to, to handle as well. Um, we've also got a full set of embargo options. So Dan will take a look at those a bit later. You can embargo by IP. You can embargo um, only files only, which is the traditional scholar, quote unquote, type of embargo. And we can also do mediated access capability. So if you want to have users hit a landing page for a research output that's embargoed and be able to apply to have access to that, this can be configured as well. So we'll cover more about that in our driving the bus section, which is what I call it when we run anything. Now, providing for the user's needs, again, we, we require that fast intuitive search um, and be able to do configurable facets. And, I'm going to do just a quick thing to put some flesh, just a couple of screen caps on here. Dan, look at these in details. This is a very, very basic unthemed IR instance, just a test machine with some basic content that I bought up. So 
There's a feature on the front that allow you to browse in by content type. You can build view blocks to browse in however you want. Um, search features, below me present, publication date, titles, abstracts. You can add authors and scholars to this of any relationships. Um, dates of ingest, you can clearly indicate the type of research outputs, um, what the access status is, and there's a configurable set of set of assets that you can use to present these. So it's very, very quick to tunnel in, hey, I only want to see research data sets that have a green open access status. So quick access to content is super important. And then the landing pages are designed to be as rich as they can. Um, where we're going to show outputs, all of the metadata associated with them, what are their rights and accessing, what people are affiliated with these, their identifiers, and all of these fields that you're seeing and, and blocks are themable within Drupal. This is just a basic out of the box presentation layer. If there are relationships, those are exposed in a block on the page. You've got a copy to clipboard citation feature. We'll talk about the state of uh, site proc support in a bit. But the idea is to be able to show everything, the description, all of the attributions, rights and licensing, usage statistics for the number of downloads and, um, and views, all of the relationships and give the users interactions. And again, if something's embargoed, so hey, you can't download these files, but you can apply for access. Um, we also have made content discoverable by search engines and harvestable by aggregator, aggregators. So there's the ability to embed Google Scholar tags for indexing. Um, and also there's a, um, the content type that we've created for the IR as a mapping for OAI. So there's an OAI PMH endpoint that you can hook up to get your, harvest, your content harvested by any aggregator, aggregator that takes an OAI feed, which is uh, pretty close to all of them. Um, other exports can be done in a, in a bespoke fashion without too, too much trouble. So as far as scholar and organizational features, there's a current state and a future state that we're working on. So these allow us to create a a web of institutional profiles. And again, Dan's gonna, gonna illustrate these. The idea is we can store a really rich set of information for each organizational unit and each scholars. And these actually have associations to each other. The organizational units allow for parent-child relationships so that you can build a web of all of the units of your organizations that is traversable and usable for different types of views. Um, and these also, the organizational unit taxonomies also have additional metadata about the units that can be used for displays. Scholars also allow associations between themselves and the organizational units that they belong to. So currently all of that structure, the very rich structure is done. What we're working on now is landing pages for the scholars and units. And what this is gonna allow that if I'm a scholar and, and I log into the IR, on my user profile, I'll be able to quickly see a view of all my works and the usage statistics around them. So I can log in, see how many views, how many downloads that I have, be able to quickly see uh, if I've got anything in review, be able to see the status of that particular output. Um, and also users will be able to manage their identifications and profile informations. So if they've got a HAL ID or an ORCID ID or some other type of scholar ID to enter into their profile, um, they want to um, put in a biography, upload an image. Those, some of those features are already there. It's a matter of tying them into their user profiles that we're working on currently. Now, uh, before I turn Dan loose, um, just some, some kind of high, highlights that I want to go through of more features. As you've seen, we've got, a, we've got a brandable presentation layer that has base and custom options. If you want to use the IR out of the box, you can go with a base theme that allows you to select a hero image, a color set, and font configurations. Um, and then all of the views on the front page and the footer and nav bar menu items are configurable in Drupal. If you are able to do that yourself, you can handle it. And as with anything else, whatever level of assistance that you require, DGI can provide it with you as a service. We've got a standard set of user roles for IR users that will probably work for most people out of the box so that you can confine people who are depositors 
and submitters versus people who are in a reviewing role versus people who are actually repository managers. We can integrate with single sign-on systems. So if you're running CAS or Shibboleth or any type of SAML system, then we can integrate with that. Um, and we can actually auto provision roles to users on first sign in if you wish. Um, and you've got a lot of community options for being able to control access to the features and the content. Um, bulk ingests are achieved using uh, CSV ingest. And as I mentioned, we also have the API for any kind of special integration to bring content in that you wish. There's a no code set of tools that we train people to be able to use to affect custom forms. Obviously, while research outputs will have a core metadata set, such as their titles and identifiers and things that they'll use, there's a big difference between entering a journal article and a thesis or a research data set in terms of the metadata profiles that they use. We've accommodated this using no-code tools that let you say what roles can see which fields and which fields should appear for a given type of research output. Dan's gonna take a look at that. Um, and Drupal provides you a really easy content management UI. And if you need to customize the views for particular workflows or needs that you have, that can be handled. As uh, indicated, we can integrate with identifier services. We talked about getting, uh, getting your content exposed elsewhere. And we've got analytics options. You can, at this point in time, you can integrate with Google Analytics and also with Matomo. And both of those platforms uh, just now offer options to get geographic views integrated to the home page if you'd like. So if you want to have a real time map of who, in, who is interacting with your content, that's now an option. So I think now we're going to go on the tour time and uh, I'll hand over the wheel of the bus to, uh, to Dan and I leave you in good hands. All right, let me just uh, share. Yes, I would like to stop Better share screening. I would like to share specifically uh, this right here. There we go. Okay, so this is uh, just a development site uh, that I have spun up. It's got a little bit of test content in it. Uh, we're just going to go through a couple of things here. Uh, a lot of it's stuff that uh, Stephen's kind of alluded to, but we're going to take a look at how it actually works here. Um, this is the default front landing page. It has uh, some search options, some deposit options. You can see it's got a little bit of uh, statistics, like we're we're pulling out uh, specific numbers of things that are in the repository based on content type, which is. Uh, uh, just something fun you can do. Um, so by default, it's showing like how many items are in the repository based on different types of those items, which is something we'll take a peek at in a bit. Um, you see, there's not much in here. Um, there's just a little bit of test content. It's essentially the same as what uh, Stephen was showing you before. Uh, but we've got all these, um, the, the, the browse by type section over on the right-hand side. Uh, is something that we can do using uh, the search engine integration. Um, I'll, I'll get into perhaps why this is a little bit interesting in a bit when we actually go to uh, ingest something, but I want to take a look at a couple of other things here. Uh, we can do all sorts of things on the landing page using Drupal. Uh, we can link back to sets of search results. We can link back to filtered search results. We can uh, link to specific scholars or essentially whatever you want. Like uh, the, the way Drupal works is that you can create these little sort of branded sections, blocks that uh, contain dynamically generated information, uh, whatever you really want. So that's why it's showing things like collections and and, and these useful links are hard coded, but the, the collections aren't necessarily, they're, they're being pulled directly out um, dynamically so that you can see what's in the repository without having to manually curate these little sections. Um, let me go through the process of actually putting something new into the repository here. So I'm gonna click the deposit button over here. 
uh, which brings me to the form for creating a research output item. Uh, the first thing that it asks me is to select a type of research output uh, from this drop down here. Um, th this, as well as several other things that are in this form, are linked back to taxonomies in Drupal that we will take a quick little peek at later. Um, and this is the mechanism whereby we are able to filter down the form based on type. So you can actually see if I like scroll through the form, everything is here, all of the, you know, data set details, like things that we may not necessarily need based on the type, like, um, uh, like date first performed and last performed, that may not necessarily be uh, something that you need based on different uh, types. Uh, so what we can do is filter and pare down this form based on what type of thing that you select here up at the top, as well as all kinds of other things. Uh, you can really, using the tools that are provided to you um, and, and sort of the set of tools that we've uh, selected to put in Drupal, you can really customize how this form displays to users based on uh, what options they select as they go through the form, as well as who they are. Uh, these fields can be filtered based on roles. Uh, you can give custom roles to people that filter that stuff down. Uh, so if I scroll through here, um, I'm going to add a couple of different things in here. We'll throw in, we'll say that this is a journal article. Uh, I will give it some sort of a test title. Uh, we will give it a brief abstract of some kind. Uh, and then the only other thing that it asks me for is what the current access status of this is. We'll say it's currently open access and it asks me to confirm that I have uh, consented to a deposit agreement for the item. Um, so by virtue of, uh, this is sort of what I was alluding to earlier is that uh, if you're familiar with how um, if you're familiar with how Islandora content generally works, uh, Islandora content is generally modeled and those models tend to be directly related to a type of file, like a, a, an audio file or a video file or whatever. Um, these aren't really modeled in the same way. What we've done instead is by virtue of the fact that this particular type of content here, uh, the research output content type, which is the default type of content that ships with the, uh, the IR. By virtue of the fact that it has this research output type field into it, uh, we consider that this content type has sort of opted in to uh, the whole IR scheme. Uh, and by virtue of that, we have some fancy stuff like the ability to directly link into adding more media. So I'm going to follow through and add a document here, which is uh, what we generally reference as like a PDF. Uh, let's just save this new thing. Uh, it'll back it up, uh, put it into the back end, and then allow us to upload a PDF of some kind. I will say this is a test PDF. We will toss a file in here. Um, I will grab one out of Dropbox because I have a whole bunch of test objects in there. Uh, we will just grab a random PDF file. Um, lastly, uh, again, like there is a generally when you're speaking of Islandora content in Islandora 8, you when you upload a file, you declare its use. Uh, we have a custom use that's in the list here, which is selected by default. And using that specific media use, like leaving that in the dropdown there, opts this file into the IR, um, the whole IR scheme. So if I add that in as research output, uh, leave everything else as it is, save that, um, what it will do is it'll bring me to the landing page for this new thing that I've created. Um, it'll show me this file that I've uploaded with the uh, metadata that I added down here in the summary. Uh, it's got a couple other things on this landing page. Um, 
for all the different items. We have a, like a download link down here. If I were to add more PDFs to this or more files of any type, those would be added to the download links. Uh, there is uh, these sorts of links here, like we have a research output type of journal article. If I click on this, it'll take me to a set of search results for specifically journal articles. And those kind of links are implemented for all different kinds of things here. Uh, so not just uh, for the type of thing, but for things like scholars or access or, or stuff like that. Um, let me quickly go back to uh, this object that I created with my test title here, because I wanted to show off another couple of things uh, one of which is the embargoes section, which uh, Stephen alluded to. Uh, there are currently no embargoes on this node, but what we have um, done is taken uh, the, the, the work that was done by Florida State University to create an embargoes module for uh, Drupal 8. And we've sort of extended and expanded on that to ensure that it has sort of the same uh, parity functionality with what we had in Drupal 7. Uh, that is to say, we can add embargoes on uh, this entire node itself or to individual files within that. Uh, so this PDF that I uploaded would be embargoed. Um, we can also do the same thing as we had uh, in Islandora 7, where we can have an indefinite embargo or schedule it to be lifted on a specific date. Um, so I can pick like, it's going to be lifted next week. And lastly, uh, we have the ability to add exempt IP ranges. So you can configure, hey, uh, if you are specifically accessing the site from this range of IPs, then you can view this item. Otherwise, you are locked out. Uh, and also uh, a list of exempt users, which is something that we uh, did not necessarily have before specifically with embargoes, but which is available here now. You can exempt specific users uh, to be able to view an object uh, using the embargo section. Um, I'm gonna take a quick look at the taxonomies section here, uh, which is up under structure and then taxonomy. Uh, these are what Stephen was talking about. These are all the sort of taxonomies that we've uh, created and added to this, uh, uh, added to the IR to be able to accomplish a whole bunch of different things, uh, including uh, one of the important ones that he alluded to was this scholars section, which is uh, how we track uh, who the the different people that are scholars that cont contribute different works. And this is the information from which we are going to build those pages, which uh, show, uh, I believe some of this is, is already implemented. Like if I were to click on one of these, we can see like what they've contributed to the repository. But the idea is to flesh out this page more. Um, the research output type is the other taxonomy I was talking before about before, that big drop down menu where I selected journal article. Uh, this is where you can add new types of research output if the current ones don't uh, fit your uh, use case. Uh, all of these taxonomy terms can also be given permissions, like you can lock them down to specific users and roles if you need to. Um, and on that topic, I also wanted to take a look very briefly at uh, the uh, field filtering that uh, we alluded to before um, under the actual research output content type. Uh, we can change the way that the form is displayed, uh, which I'm not going to get too deeply into, but uh, there is a section here where we can essentially just say any one of these fields that's in the form, uh, we can have it be controlled by another field. So you can say uh, that, for instance, the um, what was that? The, the first perform date field that we were talking about? Well, that field should be controlled by the type of thing that you're adding. And it should only be able to be visible when the type field has a specific value. So you can say, okay, well, only show that uh, field or the first perform date when it has these specific types. Um, that way you can create a very 
robust set of rules in here to lock down exactly how your uh, exactly how your form looks. Um, another couple of things that should probably be alluded into here uh, while I have the chance. Um, the entirety of this, uh, if I go back here and take a look, uh, the entirety of fields in this form, every single one of them, uh, we have translated into a bulk ingest using CSV upload. Um, so there is, so if I go to structure and then uh, CSV ingests, I can, like there is a default template that exists that will translate a CSV file full of rows containing individual items. It'll take that whole thing and convert it into a bulk edition of objects. And every single one of those fields uh, that we have in the research output form is implemented here. So you can create a really robust metadata for bulk ingests from scratch. We have that sort of set up out of the box. Um, quickly, I wanna to go to search results just to take a look at this. I know Stephen briefly looked at this, but I wanted to poke at a couple of things here. Um, we have filtration over on the right hand side. So we can do some, some fancy stuff like uh, filtering on access status, filtering on specific keywords, uh, importantly, the ability to filter on the research output type. Um, also back on the front page, the ability to filter by type here is sort of a, a, a smart, filtering system which is able to figure out like oh this thing has a pdf attached or this thing has images attached um, and so you can see that like the thing that we uploaded earlier has a pdf attached so it's in here it, it counts as a, a text type thing um, so it's able to do some smart filtering over there uh, the last couple of things that i want to talk about that uh I'm not going to actually show off because I don't think the visuals on this is particularly interesting, but um, like the, the scholar integration for this does include a proper link to this specific PDF. If that PDF is available to the public, um, like that tag will be in there as one of the Google scholar meta tags, uh, as well as essentially every uh, Google Scholar meta tag that uh, they implement. Um, and we've also added the ability to filter those tags or add new tags specifically based on the type of research output that you select. So you can create uh, a meta tag profile, not just for research output as a whole, but create a meta tag profile specifically for journal article research outputs or um, conference papers or what have you. Um, so the the ability to create those meta tags is also robust. We do we do a lot of things in this based on the type of research output that you're doing. So we've. Uh, we, we've done as much as we possibly can to allow people to really uh, customize and flesh out the functionality of the site based on those types. Um, I think that was all of the things that I wanted to go over here sort of in this uh, sort of in this walkthrough. Um, I don't think I can think of anything else from my list, so I may as well uh, hand it back to uh, Stephen to continue on from here. Thanks, Dan. Um, looking for... There's some questions that have uh, have come through, but we'll and we'll get to those in, in just a couple minutes. I think Stephen has one or two things to walk through, and then we'll move over to Q and A. Yeah, one or two fifteen, <laughs> <laughs> but they'll be quick because we got to get to the Q and A stuff. All right, so I just want to talk a little bit about what's in the pipeline. Um, so we've got you know we've got a really robust release out that has what we feel are the are the core functions that are 
our production ready and has been fully, um, you know, tested. Um, so right now we're working on citations features. You probably saw we have a very basic citation feature where, you know, if you have a full citation constructed in the metadata, we can present that, the user can do it. But we're integrating CitePROC, so you'll be able to, uh, based on the metadata, use CSL style sheets that you select um, and uh, give the users, you know, the option to select, you know, AAP, Chicago style, whatever that you want to use. Um, the Scholar features we talked about, I covered how we're going to expand those so that the user profiles are linked to the, the Scholar node in the taxonomy, and they'll be able to create views on those pages for the Scholars. Um, and with, you know, with that, we'll probably roll out some new out-of-the-box page views too as well and add some lines to the, uh, some items to the main menu for, you know, browse by Scholar, browse by organizational unit. You could do that now just using views if you wish. We're going to work on impact measurement. Um, as I said, you know, Matomo and Google have given us some ways to, to build some views. We want to do an alt metrics uh, badging integration and look at some other things. There are other services that we could at any time, depending upon how it's prioritized by adopters and development, uh, integrate with things like the iris counters, et cetera. Um, also, a refined submission. Uh, right now, multi-file upload is a stepped process. We want to turn that into just a drag and drop. Um, super large file ingest. <laughs> it is what it is. You can upload something, you know, probably up to two or four gigs through the uh, through the UI if you want to wait. But that seems really silly. We need to have uh, an option where if somebody has a a really really big data set that they need to upload and reference, that we can do that. So that's in the pipe as well. Um, now, there you may need, an, you may have occasion. Uh, there are some people that have a use case that would need advanced media type fields. And what this would accommodate was where people have different rights or licensing agreements per file. Sometimes this happens, we're aware of it. So we're setting up a case for that. Um, also proxy submissions for those who have research assistants. It's nice to be able to say, hey, allow this person to submit work on my behalf or to make updates to work on my behalf. So this is a use case on the roadmap. Um, we want to make some landing page enhancements, being able to have, be able to download all of the files at once, have a CSV viewer, which are, there actually is one that um, University of PEI has up that we might be able to adapt, and a zip viewer, something that will let you view the contents of zip files if they're up for, for research data sets. Um, I mentioned some of the new home page features that we'd like. Um, Tombstoning is in the works in the community, and uh, as that moves along, we'll be working with them to integrate it into the DGIR. And also, uh, something that's you know on our radar is being able to integrate with funding identification. So, being able to put in the grid vocabulary for the you know the grant uh, identifications, and also put crossref integration into the system is on the roadmap. So, these are the things that are that are in the pipeline as we speak. Um, not necessarily in the order they'll arise. We'll, we'll take them as they come and as, as people need them. Um, so with that, the floor is yours, everybody. <laughs> Thanks, Stephen and Dan. That was really great. Um, I think Stefan sent a question through that you already answered, Stephen, but just for everyone else's benefit, um, he asked about, is the site, site as feature configurable to select citation style? i.e. APA or MLA um, or et cetera. And so I think Stephen had just, just covered that as part of kind of what's, what's coming next. So um, that's good. We had another question from Stefan. Um, there was a wait field on the ingest screen that Dan showed. What is the function of that? Dan, do you wanna take that one? Uh, absolutely. Um, so the wait field is used for a couple of different things, um, specifically for uh, the the media. Um, we use the wait field to determine. Um, so if you look on the landing page for any individual item, it's specifically showing one PDF or one image or something like that. Uh, the image that it's showing or the PDF that it's showing, which is considered to be the primary PDF or image, is the highest weighted whatever file it is. Like it doesn't matter what kind of file it is. Um, we don't 
we don't care or we make we don't really make a value judgment over what kind of file it is all that we really care about is that it is the highest weighted one in the list um so if you uh, i i didn't show it off but there is like a media attached to this research output screen uh, which allows you to like attach all kinds of pdfs or if you have you know uh the research data that's attached to a thing you can attach that as well and as long as you drag one of those to the top and leave it there uh, that will be what shows up on the landing page so that's what that's currently used for awesome thanks and thanks Stefan for the question um I think there was one other question that came through from uh Kara Hart uh, who asked how do you deal with symbols and metadata fields for example abstracts and Stephen um, answered that in the chat saying Unicode is fully supported and it's possible to use rich text in the abstract field to handle superscripts, etc. Um, I would encourage anyone who has further questions to please submit them as we have about 12 minutes left. Um, if there's, there's anything that, that you're curious about. Going once, going twice. Steven or Dan, anything else uh, you'd like to cover? Ah, we had another question come through from, oh, a couple more questions, great. Uh, will the new homepage feature be automatically turned on? Steven, do you wanna take that? Sure, sure. So yeah, anything that we add to the core configuration, we'll put there. I mean, our thought is that generally most people will at least add one or more of their own views for the content, which is so maybe you want to have a view that just says, oh, show me all of the new, you know, the new theses that have been uploaded. Some of this can be tailored by the type of content that your particular institution is, is handling or wants to feature, or maybe you want to feature certain submissions. But yes, anything that we build uh, out of the box will be available. And if it, it can be on by default. And if you want to remove that menu item or that view, it's just as simple as disabling it or enabling it. Right. And Stefan uh, asked a, a question on, will the presentation be made available? So yes, it will. Uh, I'll send uh, those that, that attended today um, the, the video recording and the slides um, so that you have them as reference. There's some stuff in the appendix too that may be um, useful that just, you know, here we talk about, about some resources that may be um, interesting for you as, as you continue to explore the topic, but then uh, some additional material on, on kind of definitions and lexicon um, that, that we would have stepped through today in the appendix. So um, absolutely, I'll, I'll make sure to send the recording once it's ready. I think it, it, it will be ready by tomorrow uh, to this group. And then there, there's some, I think, of your colleagues that weren't able to make it. So we'll be sure to send it to them as well. Any other questions? While we wait, if any others come through, I'll go back to Dan and Steven and ask if there's anything, anything that we didn't cover or that we, we browse through that may be worthwhile of revisiting. I feel good. Okay. <laughs> I feel good, good with the list we have. I think it's it's representative. And of course, if anybody wants to dive into any particular thing in detail, please just contact you know Lauren or uh, or Joe Valitum at Discovery Garden and and avail yourselves of our time. We can take a session to look at any particular need that your institution has and focus specifically on that. Or if you just leave the presentation, and say, hey, you know, I came up with a set of. Uh, of uh, questions I'd like to go through. That's fine. Just, just let us know. Yeah, my, uh, my, my expertise with this is in a large part with the back end of it and how everything is sort of wired together, um, which I don't know that that makes for good. I don't know that that makes for good TV, but um, if that is something that you're curious about, I am super super happy to answer questions yeah. uh that's this i i have uh a a 
weird amount of like th this is uh this is this kind of thing is super interesting to me um and i'm happy to talk about it and your forehead's looking remarkably well healed uh given what we went through oh yeah thank you <laughs> to get the, the first releases out <laughs> <laughs> yeah that was quite a journey so there's a question from Kara as well. Is there a test site that we can access? At this time, no. But I don't know that there's not any good reason that we shouldn't have one up at this point. So we'll, I'll take that up with Lauren and Joe after after we close out today. Yeah. 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 Good question, Kara. Yeah, we have one up right now. It's um, it's it's it, it's IP restricted. I don't think there's any reason that we shouldn't expose that. So let's get to talk to that. And and Kara, please make sure that Lauren has your contact information. I think I do, Kara, from uh, from your registration. So we'll follow up. Follow up. Uh, Meletta asks, "What's what's my email?" So it's Lauren at discoverygarden.ca. So pretty pretty simple. Uh, I'll just write it in the chat uh, as well, so you have it. There we go. Okay, so with about seven minutes to spare, I think we can can give people seven minutes back before they head to their next meeting. I know it's always appreciated to have a chance to in this virtual world, which I'm sure you're all still operating in, um, you know, grab a glass of water or coffee. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, was was really great for 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 you to be here, but then also for Dan and Stephen, I want to thank you for taking the time to step through the IR. Um, as I think both all three of us have said, actually, like feel free to reach out at any point, and we can we can step through this in a little bit more um, detail, and and we'll be sure to follow up uh, specifically on Kara's question on on the test site. So. Um, thank you so much and uh, hope you all have a great rest of the day and rest of the week. Thank you thank all you. and thank you Lauren for making it happen. Yeah, thanks. Awesome. Bye.